Hallelujah, my brother in Christ. Hallelujah. We don't need no preaching now. I heard that. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Hallelujah. Oh, man. I tell you what, all I can do now is mess it up. <laughs> you know, you set the stage for me, brother. God bless you. Hallelujah. Grace and peace from God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If you have the Word of God all over the sanctuary, whether in printed or digital format, would you please raise your Bibles in the air over you? There you go. Hallelujah. So good, Miss Shirley. I see you're not playing solitaire this morning. So that's, a, that's just a blessing. Turn, if you would, please, in the Word of God to Romans. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. Friends, God has called me to feed the sheep. And my calling is to feed the sheep with the best food that there is. The Word of Almighty God. We are not here today to hear from Brister. We're not here today to hear from each other. We are here today to see what God and hear what God has to say to us in our hearts today. Because truly, there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. And it, listen, wherever you are today, whatever your life is like, I want you to know that there is no hole so deep that the love of God is not deeper still through Christ Jesus the Lord. You may say, Pastor Larry, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how I've acted. It doesn't matter. Jesus died on the cross for every single person that has ever lived. And I declare to you today that Emmanuel Baptist Church, this day, however you arrived here, if you came without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, it is our fervent, heartfelt desire that you not leave the same way that you came. I want you to know that every Christian here is praying for you today. We don't want to go to heaven without you. But see, according to Scripture, we've got a problem. <laughs> and the problem is sin. And uh, as we've been working our way through this, uh, this, this new series, Life in Christ Alone, uh, the last previous two weeks and today is all about God's consummate judgment. In Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. And I'm just going to read the first couple of verses and then we will read the rest as we go along. If you're there in a paper Bible, say amen. amen. Reading from the Word of God. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God. And know His will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. May the Lord add his blessings upon his word. Father God, we ask today that you bless the teacher, that you forgive him his sins, for they are many, that he speak your truths and your truths only. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to say that today, if you are saved, if you are one of the redeemed of God, then today's message is not about you, but it is for you. So don't relax. You see, my job as a pastor, as a preacher, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? The sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a gospel teaching, gospel preaching church. Amen? That's the sole reason for which we exist, is to, is to share the gospel and bring glory to God. And so today, this message for the redeemed is so that you will recognize the needs in people. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are here today and you're not saved, then today's message is about you. But not as a criticism. Not as an accusation. But as an instructional format. Informational. And as an encouragement for you to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. We want to be an encouragement. I want to deliver today's message with compassion. You know, sometimes we preachers, when we preach, you know, we, we, we do our hands out, we point. We want you to know that when we point with that finger, that three fingers are pointing right back at us. Amen. Amen. So whatever this message is about to do to you, and as my brother in Christ said, I'd like for you to fasten your seatbelts, 
return your trays and seats to the upright and locked position because I feel like preaching after that good plan today. Hallelujah. We don't want you to leave the same way you came in. First, as a review of our current series, uh, in the first half of Romans chapter 1, we have the introduction. Uh, Paul sets the stage and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then in the second half, things turn ugly. And Paul uh, starts presenting the message from the book of Romans much as we would be in a courtroom. In the second half of Romans chapter 1, it's all about what the infractions are. He lays the case for which things have been broken, which things have uh, been done. And some of us think that the, the, the rest of, of, of uh, all of chapter 2 is about uh, people, uh, how they're pleading to the case. But that's not really true. Because what we see first is that people try to get dismission of charges. In other words, they try to get the case thrown out of court before the, the court ever begins. Uh, in Romans chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 10, Paul goes after the moralists. Those who believe, uh, well, I'm better than them. Surely God will let me into heaven because I'm not quite as bad as uh, this guy over here. Uh, and by the way, who sets the standards in that? Us. In Romans chapter uh, 2, verses 11 through 16, what we covered last week, Paul blessed those that, are, that claim ignorance of the law. They claim that they're ignorant of what is going on there. Uh, the, the, recognize that I did not say those that are incapable of learning, but those that say, I am ignorant of the law. In other words, those that say, uh, I, don't, I didn't know. He, certainly God can't keep me out of, the heaven, out of heaven because I didn't know. And we know that in the, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And in our passage today, in Romans chapter 7, 2, verses 17 through 10, through 29, he is going to bombard the religious. Those who say, what? I'm going to go to hell? I go to church three times a week. You see, these are the religious unsaved church people, which actually, by the way, is the very, most, the very hardest group to address. The, the people that are toughest to get to. And uh, it's those people who think that uh, they have all the bases covered. They, they come to church. They give of their tithes. Uh, they, they, they do good works. Yet they have never received Jesus Christ as Lord. Friends, there is one requirement for you to go to heaven. You must receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Why? Because Jesus said so. In John chapter 14, verse 6, well, we read, Jesus says, get ready to go with me, church. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. What? Oh, you guys are making your pastor look good this morning, huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. But listen now. So please remember that as we go through our passage, that Paul himself was raised as a Jew. He was a Hebrew's Hebrew. He's a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin and a Pharisee. And he uses some pretty strong words here in Romans chapter 2 against his own people. But he is definitely not an anti-Semite. He isn't making an ethnic slur, but he's arguing that everyone, whether religious or irreligious, is a sinner. What is Romans chapter 3, verse 23? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, we are in desperate, desperate need of a Savior. We are not sinners because we sin. Hallelujah. We sin because we are sinners by nature. If you don't think so, then uh, moms and dads that are here today with your children, just look at that little bundle of joy sitting next to you. And remember, if you ever had to teach them to go, mine. Or hit their brother or sister or cousin. Now, you might have that golden child, uh, you know, uh, a child perhaps like I was. Uh, wrong. I was the oldest brother, and you know what oldest, oldest children are like, amen? Uh, but, but no, we are all sinners. And Paul introduced us to this idea earlier. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16, reading, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to what? Salvation for everyone who believes, for the what? Jew first, and also for the Greek. Just remember that Paul loved Jewish people. 
We can read, see his heart over in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Flip in your Bibles over there if you would for just a moment. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. And if you're there in a paper Bible, please say, Amen. Now if you're there in a paper Bible, someone say, Amen. amen. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Is that your heart's desire this morning, Emmanuel Baptist Church? Is your heart's desire for people to be saved? If that is your heart's desire, then that will be the driving force behind the success of Emmanuel Baptist Church. I was asked this morning in pastor's prayer, uh, Pastor, how should we pray uh, for, for, for good scriptures to, to help grow the church? I said, why don't, you, why don't we pray that we would be obedient to the Word of God? Hallelujah. And that we would stay faithful. You see, if we are obedient to the Word of God, if we stay faithful, uh, then God will grow His church. God will draw men unto Himself. Uh, my job is not to fill the pews. Hallelujah. My job is to fill the pulpit. God will take care of the pews in Jesus' name. And so, just remember that, that Paul loved the Jewish people. Now, the Jews were proud of being chosen by God. Uh, they, they thought that somehow they were better, and that's why God chose them. Uh, uh, you know, they, to them, titles were important. Uh, they often, in these, these times that we're reading about here in the book of Romans, they themselves added the name Jew at the end of their name. As in Simon bar Joseph, Jew. Uh, they were also called Hebrews because of the language they spoke. They were also called Israelites because of the land that they had been given. But by Jesus' day, they were most commonly known as Jews. And so today, I hope that you have your notes in front of you and you're able to jot down. Uh, we have two very simple points. I will, of course, have a few sub-points. I am a preacher after all. But I have two simple points today. And if you have your notes in front of you, please say amen. amen. So how do, we, how do we get to that point to where we are in a proper relationship with God. And so the first point today is that we are to reject religion over relationship. Reject religion over relationship. Now don't look at me with those blank faces. You know what I'm talking about. You know, those folks that you, know, you can come to church and uh, they've been in church since they were before they were born. They have the 14-pound Bible... And when they talk, they hold the Bible like this and they take off their glasses <laughs> to make their point. Hallelujah. Yeah, you know, uh, us preachers like to do that sometimes too. That's why I never do that up here. It puts me in the wrong frame of mind. You see, when we focus on the real religion, when we focus on the eternal, there are some traps that we can fall into. So to keep us from thinking this passage is just for them, just for the unsaved religious, I have four subpoints here. Maybe you can jot down going across the line underneath uh, your first point there. Uh, these are what we call four flaws in people. Now, I don't see how I could possibly personally have found, found, fallen into any of these. And no, you may not talk to my wife afterwards. <laughs> but the first flaw, look at verses 17 and 18 again in Romans chapter 2. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God. And know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. You see, the first problem that they had was pride. They had the problem of pride. In those two verses, we see that the Jewish people had been given four advantages. Uh, they, had, they, they had a reliance on the law, and they had this idea that keeping the law will save me. Let me just share this with you. How many commandments are there, church? And how many commandments has every single one of us broken? Ten. Ten. Hallelujah. You may say, wait a minute, preacher, I never killed anybody. I didn't murder anybody. Oh, really? Jesus said, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he says, if you have anger in your heart against your brother, or call him rakfa, which is fool, you have committed what? Murder in your heart. So once again, how many of the Ten Commandments have we all broken? All of them. Hallelujah. I knew I could get you guys to say that. So, so keeping the law will save me. Second, uh, they had, they, they were, they, the, the advantage that they had was a relationship with the Lord. And they actually bragged about that relationship. Then they had a, they had, they had a recognition of God's will. 
Here was the problem. They knew it, but they didn't do it. We ever fall into that? We know the will of God. We simply haven't done the will of God. And then they had another advantage. They had a, God had put in them a relish, a, a desire for moral standards. But of course, they had changed it so that they were the moral standard. In other words, uh, I shall be the moral high ground on these types of things. So but instead of using that uh, for good, it ultimately just led to their arrogance. Their prideful, terrible uh, outpouring in their character. Now those advantages that they had are actually good things. But when they started about to brag about their special position, pride set in. Friends, let us never be prideful because of our salvation. When we look at the worst sinners in the world that we think, there but for the grace of God go we. Hallelujah. Amen. So first, uh, you know, they, were, they, were, they had the pride that said it. Matter of fact, they were kind of like the puffed up Pharisee. We all remember him. If you look up on the screen, Luke chapter 18, verse 11. Uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Now, can you imagine that? Lord, I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here. You know, uh, he only prayed about himself and he thought that he was better than those around him. Believing that his sin didn't smell just as bad to God as everybody else's did. Hallelujah. The Jewish people's religious privilege had made them self-righteous, self-centered, and self-deceived snobs wrapped up in pretty packages. Look at, uh, at, at our screen again. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge, what? Puffs up, but love edifies. Friends, people don't care how much you know. They, they, they want to know how much you care. Do we care for our fellow man? Do we care for those that are apart of from Christ. But think about it. Isn't it silly for us to be prideful about receiving God's grace and God's mercy? Isn't that silly? If anything, we should be broken and humble. Christians, by the way, have no problem with these passages. We Christians know that we bring nothing to the table. We simply come into the presence of Almighty God and throw ourselves at His feet. Amen? Why? Because the sinless Son of God took our punishment. So not only pride, the other, the other uh, little sub-point here is they became presumptive. Presumptive. Look at verses 19 and 20. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in uh, the law. When pride captures our heart, we then feel compelled to act like biblical know-it-alls. I worked real hard on that. I thought you guys would be more impressed. Let me try that one more time. When pride captures our heart, we then feel compelled to act like biblical know-it-alls by focusing on other people's shortcomings. Hey, hallelujah. And focusing on how much we think we know. Uh, let me just share you something with you, friends. Uh, in the course of the last 25, 30 years, I have read through my Bible over 200 times. And the more I've studied and the more I've read, let me share what I know. I know that I don't know anything except that God is God and I am not. Amen. That God is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly holy and I am not. And that I need His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's the biblical knowledge that I've received from my Heavenly Father. Now, again, part of this good is good because God's people have been given the re responsibility for reaching out to unbelievers around them. This goes all the way back to the blessings given to Abraham when he was told in Genesis 12 verse 3 that all people on the earth would be blessed, what? Through him. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 6 says that the Jewish people were to be a light to the Gentiles. Look around the church here. Everybody look around in the sanctuary right here. Uh, Gentiles, that's you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 
Hallelujah. But a flaw of religious people is that they get pleasure out of telling other people what to do. Being a little bossy. They see themselves as the guide for the blind instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. They see themselves as the light for those in the dark. They see themselves as the instructor for the foolish, as a teacher for the infants. Now before we move on, let me say again that these are good things that we do. We should be doing those things, but there shouldn't be a puffed up pride in the action of that. Because at one time, every single one of us were just like that. Every single one of us. But here in Romans, because they were not living the law themselves, their pride filled them with presumption. They acted like prophets to other people, and in reality they were just pretenders. Which is our third point. Because pride leads to presumption, which leads to pretenders. <laughs> Look at verses 21 and 22. If you're there, say amen. amen. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob the temples? You see, they love to point out problems and faults of other people. Pointing fingers at other people's sins while quickly forgiving their own sin. It is so easy to preach and not practice, isn't it? You know, I have the things in my life that I struggle with. And let me tell you, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty happy guy. Uh, Miss Ruth Ann calls me old rose-colored glasses. That's what, I'm, that's what I am. Amen? But I have those things that I struggle with. But you know what I resent is when she, when, when I'm struggling in those areas, she, she brings up a sermon of my own I should go listen to. And that's just hitting right. Hallelujah. That just hitting right. So, it's easy to preach and not practice. And religious people are really good at telling other people what to do and how to live. Jeremiah 29, 13, if you look on the screen, hits them right in the gut. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths... Well, this is a little rude. And honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. What do our current what does our current world say about God? What are the commandments of men these days about regarding the holiness of God? So pride, presumption, finally we come to, then pretension, and finally we come to the fourth bullet point, profaning. Look at verses 23 and 24. You who make your boast in the law, do you honor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. What? Because of you, as it is written. Once pride takes root, we become filled with presumption. We start blasting others. When in fact we're just pretenders who end up profaning the holy name of God. Do people look at me? Do people look at you? Do people look at uh, folks from Emmanuel Baptist Church and say, Hey, you know what, Pastor Larry? I think if people meet me, they would want to come to our church. I'm friendly. I'm not, I'm not arrogant. Boy, it's getting quiet in here now. Let me move on. And apparently I'm meddling in everybody's lives. So, but, but if we do those things, we have two disastrous, disastrous consequences. In verse 23, they, they, the word brag is used. Their, their pride led to their downfall because they were now dishonoring the very name of God that they claimed to be serving. And second, once we profane God, we end up pushing people away from God. And even worse, our behavior can cause others to blaspheme. Look at verse 24 one time. One more time. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. There is a reason why I begin and end every single message with what? Grace and peace from God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me, Emmanuel Church. We are the only Jesus some people will ever meet. We are the only Jesus they will ever meet. And people believe what they behold. So be kind, like I know you are. You are the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Keep it up outside the doors, amen? Say amen, please. Amen. Otherwise, I've got to stay right there and preach for another 10 minutes. And you know, we, want, we want to move along here. I want to hear some more, I want to hear some more of this, this, this sweet music over here. 
So let's, let's, let's guard against the flaws of pride and presumption, um, pretending and profane, profaning. So reject religion over relationship. Second point, of course, this is simple, choose relationship over religion. Choose a relationship with Almighty God over the religion itself. You know why a lot of people don't want to go to church? They've already done that. Church should be exciting. You should come into church going, what's God going to do today? What, 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 is, what, what, what great thing is God, God going to do? Wait a minute, who's that guy with that horn looking thing? Hallelujah, that's exciting, amen? amen? Hey, we got a new song, hallelujah. Hey, Pastor Larry's on time today, hallelujah. Amen? amen? So choose relationship over religion. Left to ourselves, though, friends, we will choose religion over relationship every single time. We will choose form over faith. We will choose profession over possession. And in this case, there are actually two, only two subpoints about what you could do. And by the fact, they're not really subpoints. In order to, have, to choose this relationship over religion, you can make one of two choices in how to live a Christ-like life. First, you can try to prove your religion by outward signs. You can try to prove your religion. That's a choice you can make. Look at verses 25 to 27. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, what do we say when we see that word, therefore? What is it there for? Hallelujah. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? Paul goes right after the Jewish people. He goes right after their biggest prop, the things that they were all about. He goes after the one absolute sign which the Jewish person, the Jewish man prided himself on as a member of God's covenant, circumcision. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to picture scenes in the Bible. And you remember when, when, when Abraham went and spoke with God, and God gave Abraham the promise. But then, in order to lock that covenant... There was something that had to be done. Can you imagine Abraham when he went back to the campfire by the men? And they, said, and they asked, well, what did the Lord have to say? Did you speak with the Lord? Yes, I spoke with the Lord. What did the Lord have to say? He said, well, there's good news. And there's some bad news. <laughs> Can you imagine how that went over? around the, the good news is we are God's people. Amen. Bad news. Ladies, if you'll excuse us for a moment. <laughs> And circumcised the children of Israel. See, they felt somehow that this made them superior. That it made them above it all. But listen to me. The only reason they were special is because God chose them. The only thing that makes me special is that God loves me. And he saved me. And he brought me up to be his own. You see, circumcision was not then... And to this very day, circumcision is not a ticket to heaven. Church people, we fall into the same trap when we think that an outward sign like baptism or communion or church membership somehow saves us. No, you must receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Pastor, do you have any examples? Of course I have an example. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. If you look at the Golgotha, the three crosses at Golgotha, you see Christ in the middle. You see the criminal on one side cursing him. You see the criminal on the other side saying, What? Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. What did Jesus say? This very day you will be with me in paradise. That, that criminal did not have time to go to church. He did not have time to get baptized. He did not have time to do good deeds. Pains me to say this is a Baptist preacher. He did not have time to tithe. But he's in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I thought I'd get a better chuckle out of that. But that's all right. We're moving along here. You see, friend, those things aren't what get us to heaven. Never forget this. That rituals without the reality is empty. It's just a ritual. Because to God, the heart matters. God sees the heart. 
Heart matters at the heart of the matter. But my question is, have you been trusting in a ritual or do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that is the only true choice. You can choose to follow Christ or not. Friends, the second choice is you must be spiritually changed. Paul wraps this all up in Romans chapter 28 and 29. If you're there, please say amen. amen. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from who? But from God. Paul is saying, don't focus on the external. Don't focus on the outward. Notice the four contrasts in those two verses. It's the outward versus the inward. It's the physical versus the heart. It's the written code versus the Spirit of God. It's men versus God. Listen to me. The only way that you can experience renewal is by allowing Jesus Christ to save you and to change you. You see, we need the inner transformation, friends. Hallelujah. That only comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit comes, what else comes? A burning desire to please God. Do you have that burning desire in your heart? Is God your priority? Friends, I know, I know, I know we're getting to that part of the message where we relax a little bit. We've, we've heard all the bad news and we've settled down. We've gotten past that and we're starting to relax. But I need you to look up here and, and pay close attention. If we please God, it doesn't matter whom we displease. But if we displease God, it doesn't matter who we please. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. I'm going to say that one more time. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Amen. Look at the last nine words of, that, of, of, of uh, Romans chapter 2 again, if you would, please. The last nine words. Whose praise is not from men, but from God. At Emmanuel Baptist Church, we are going to please God. Amen. We're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to keep th those things true. The true believer, the true church, is, those, is, is, is a church that is filled with believers whose, whose inner relationship is with Jesus Christ. Which results in praise from God. Amen. Praise from God. That's what I care about. I don't care about the praises of man. We care about the praises of God. So how do we apply what we just uh, spoke about this morning? Well, first, live what you say you believe. Do you do that? Do you live what you say that you believe? And do you practice it until you get good at it? Friends, it is time to be completely committed to Christ. Don't go in halfway. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, there's two types of people that, that go up to a swimming pool. All right? There are those people that go up and they do what? They dip their toe in the water to see how cold or hot it is. And then they work their way into the water. Then they have the cannonball people. There's water there, and I'm just diving in it. Amen? Be a cannonball Christian. Be a Neanderthal Christian. Be a Christian that lives a joyous life for Almighty God. Make sure you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and aren't just involved in rituals. Grow on the inside so that it shows on the outside. You know, most of us look pretty good on the outside, especially on Sunday morning, amen? So let's try, stop trying to make our outside product pretty. And move the inside closer to God. And let me close with this thought. God uses simple people to do His work. God uses simple people to do His work. So that all the glory goes to Him. Jesus was once asked what, is the greatest commandment, what the greatest commandment was. What did He say? In Matthew chapter 22 verse 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Friends, that is a call to worship. 
You with me? Say amen. amen. That is a call to worship our God. Jesus then said in verse 39, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is a call to missions. We are called to worship God and we are called to missions. So where are you at today with both of them? Let me ask you this. Do you have a quiet time daily with God? Do you have a time of devotion? Your time with the Lord, loving Him with all of your heart, mind, and power. How is that time? Is that time consistent? Inconsistent? Or non-existent? And the time with your neighbor, I'm going to say that again, the time with your neighbor, loving Him, is that time consistent? Inconsistent? Or non-existent? Christians, don't let just Christians be your friends. There's a lost and dying world out there. Avoid religion so that they can receive Jesus Christ and be saved today. Dr. Luke writes about Jesus being the only means of salvation in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 when he says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by what? By which we must be saved. There is only one way into heaven, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't take Dr. Luke's word for it. Remember John 14, 6. Amen. We said it earlier today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father in, 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 except through me. And all of God's people said, Amen. Grace and peace from God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 22, begins, Look to me and be saved. Look to me and be saved as our praise team comes. That's such a simple command. Hallelujah. Give God some praise in this house. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45, 22 says, Look to me and be saved. That is easy to do, amen? If you just look to the Lord, anybody can do that. It doesn't require work. It doesn't require effort. Look to the Lord. Don't look to yourself. Don't look to what the, Lord, the, the world says is the way to heaven. Don't look at what some book says. Look unto the Lord. Look unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. Look to the Lord and be saved. You see... If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord, you are not saved. You are separated from Him. And we want you to be saved today. Hallelujah. And that passage goes on to say, For I am God, and there is none other. It's something that only God can do. So what I'm going to do in just a second, I'm going to have everyone bow their heads and pray. And as I pray, if you receive Jesus Christ for the first time today, whether you're here in this sanctuary or you're watching live on the internet and on Facebook and on YouTube. If, you're, if you receive Christ as your Lord today, where you're at, pray quietly to yourself. Repeat the words I'm about to say. The words are not what save you. If you've received Christ, you are already eternally, gloriously saved. Emmanuel Baptist Church, during this time, and all the redeemed of God, I want you to be in prayer for the people that may have be coming to Christ today. There is nothing that we do that is more important than this five minutes. Everything we've done throughout the week, the preparation of the praise team, the preparation of our sound teams, our greeters, our ushers, our Sunday school teachers, the pastors, the preachers, the special music people, everything that we have done is built to this moment that a lost person shall receive Jesus Christ as Lord. And after we pray, when we stand to sing, if you receive Christ for the first time in your life, I want you to walk down this aisle to me. I want to pray with you. And we want to rejoice with you. Because when you prayed to receive Christ, a great shout went up in heaven. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels rejoiced. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord today, simply repeat these words. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. The water you turned into wine Open the eyes
of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is here 